Hello there everyone and welcome back to the Closet Historian in my sewing room where today I'm going to be answering the age-old existential question. Why darts? What even is a dart? How do I how do I get them? How do I move them? What do I do with them? What how do I fit with them? Do they change the fit? What all the questions about darts hopefully will be answered in today's video. As you know if you've been around here on my channel or even before that even on my blog I sew with wovens most of the time. Every once in a while like once Every five years or so, I will try sewing with a knit, but most of the time I'm sewing woven garments that fit quite closely to the body. So me and darts uh, work, work quite close confidants. And of course I do all my flat pattern drafting, starting with a two dart bodice sloper that I have shown various ways to make a sloper like that here on the channel before, or talked about different ways to make a sloper like that. And um, I have worked with single dart slopers before, but it's very easy to turn a single dart sloper into a two dart sloper, which is something that we will cover later on in this video as well. But I think before I start demonstrating dart manipulation, it is important to go over exactly why darts in general, and luckily this question can easily be dispelled and answered once you start watching this demonstration of me trying to take a 2D flat piece of fabric and make it work to clothe a 3D body. So yes, here we are. This is a piece of muslin. It's a plainly woven uh, unbleached cotton fabric here. Um, the cross grain and the lengthwise grain don't stretch very much, just like any woven, but this bias here on the 45 degree angle does stretch a little bit, which is why sometimes things are cut on the bias to utilize that stretch and movement inherent in the weave like this. Most woven fabrics have a bit of stretch on the bias like that, but otherwise this is quite a stiff and stable fabric to work with. And it is what is used to dra uh, drape on the, on the form and, and draft a sloper directly on a dress form or a person as well. Um, easier to do on a dress form than a person because people tend to get offended if you pin right into them, but the dress form doesn't complain. But let's draw a couple of lines on this piece of muslin and then we will take it over and take this 2D flat piece of muslin and start figuring out how to make it into a 3D shell to clothe this form. Now this is not a real dressmaking dress form, this is a display dress form, um, a mannequin as it were, not a real dress form, but she's going to do the job of showing us at least how I would do this if I did have a real dress form hanging around. I'm just going to pin that uh, line I drew along the straight um, grain of this fabric along the center of the dress form here. I also have another line that's going to cross directly across the bust here, but you can already see how this starts falling into, you know, little dart-like shapes here. As soon as we try and take this 2D piece of fabric and start trying to clothe a 3D curvy body, we start needing some way to control the extra fullness and smooth things down to the body underneath. So up here in the shoulder, I'm going to go ahead and pinch away some of this fabric so that everything lies smooth up here. And you'll notice that looks quite conspicuously like a dart. Um, I have the bust straight across here. So my grain line is staying consistent. And I will go ahead and pin along the side seam again of this mannequin, not really a dress form once again. But again, we have this extra here, um, which one way we could fit that down is to just, you know, pinch it into a sort of triangle-ish shape, shape here. Um, looks again, quite a lot like a dart. That's right. So darts are just triangles of fullness being removed to make a 2D piece of fabric shape and fit to a 3D body underneath. Anywhere there is a curve, um, in this case the cone of the bust here on the front, uh, we're going to have to work around that curve and the I'll be focusing mostly today on how we use darts around the front uh, of a bodice here where the bust is because that's the biggest uh, cone, the biggest curve we have to work with usually, especially in the bodice. But I can go ahead and move this dart here down from the shoulder. If I smooth out that shoulder, I can move that dart from up there right into the side and the fit is still maintained. So I can move that fullness down here from the bust into the side seam instead. And so now I have a bust or a side dart and a um, waist dart from the bust, but I can go ahead and remove these pins again and swing all of this fullness into one dart if I want to. So I will go ahead and do that and move it all up into this side dart as well. Um, my bodice, of course, my flat patterned block pattern that you see me use here on the channel, I do have two darts, a side dart and a waist dart. Um, it's usually nice, especially if there's a big difference between the bust and the waist measurement, to have that split into multiple darts as opposed to just trying to sew one big dart and not end up with a very cone-like shape. But here it is all swung into one side dart here and you can see we have the waist relatively smooth and the top is all smooth. The fit hasn't changed even though the dart has moved. Um, and of course this fabric below the waist here it's uh, pulling because it's interacting with the curve of the hip which starts to get bigger so I have slashed up to just the waist point and I will go ahead and cut away the like faux arm side on this mannequin which again she doesn't have arms much um, so it's not a really traditional arm side but I will cut away the excess here. You really get a feel for how a sloper is draped on a dress form. 
Uh, this is how I was first taught ever to make a sloper or bodice block, was to do it not from measurements, but from my uh, dress form in class. They give us a size 8 dress form, which is not a US size 8, but more like a European size 8. It's much smaller. I would say it's a US 2 or 4, maybe, um, if I had to guess. So never making things that I could wear back in fashion school. So I was making things for little mannequins like this that I couldn't try on even. Um, so I had to learn to fit myself afterwards, which is why I don't know how to fit anybody else. But here, cutting away the excess, we can see we have basically a pattern here. And you can drape a sloper or a um, bodice block, basically, on yourself, um, a lot harder, um, but, or, or on someone else. Again, you just can't pin straight into that person. Again, they will stop being your friend if you do that, and the muslin will get all messy. So, you know, you have to be a little bit more careful. But here I'm just going to mark where the side seam is on this muslin here. Again, always feel free to draw directly on your muslins, whether you're trying them on or working on a form like this. I'm just marking where the apex is, where the waistline seems to be. Again, this is a dress mannequin for photographing clothes, not for doing this. So this is not the official, you know, situation. It's just a demonstration to show you why darts are immediately necessary once you start trying to take something 2D and make it 3D. Let's go ahead and take this off of this dress form and I'll show you how to take a pattern draped like this and make it into a paper pattern. So I've got my piece of muslin here with everything kind of that I would need indicated and drawn on. I will draw a straight line and line up the line from the fabric on there. I may just end up, um, I'm going to use a tracing wheel for this by the way, so you won't be able to really see on camera, but hopefully you'll get the idea. I'm just going to go ahead and pin muslin directly to the paper and I'm going to press through the muslin onto the paper with this little tracing wheel and it's going to create like little perforations underneath that I can follow then with my pen to transfer those marks over. And then up here, I had just cut this away. So I'm just going to sketch this in because I don't um, have seam allowance kind of on there yet. I would have to add it in as opposed to the side seam where I kind of left myself a buffer of seam allowance. I do want to mark my apex on here. So I just used a pin to poke through to the paper there. And I'll just transfer over my dart markings here and I can draw them in. Again, that tracing wheel has left me perforations here. So I can just sketch over those. And this is how you just make a paper pattern out of anything you've draped over on the dress form. Um, this is kind of the opposite direction. I never really do draping here on the channel. I don't do draping anymore because again, I don't have a proper dress form, but um, it is something I was also trained in and it's very fun. I just, uh, I don't think it's absolutely necessary. A lot of people will look at a very like floopy drapey design and think, oh, I have to have a dress form to be able to drape something like that. And you can do any draped design you like, flat patterning, and then uh, go that direction as well. We'll get to that later. Here I'm going to fold my dark closed and then I will, um, cut along the side seam here to get the correct shape for my dart with the fullness pressed down towards the waistline like it will need to be. And I'll cut the rest of this out. So now I have a single dart bodice sloper basically for that dress mannequin. Um, but let's go ahead and make this into a two dart. If you have a bodice, for example, that only has one dart and you would like to add another one, you just, you just cut up where you want it to be, close half of the other friend, and now you have a two dart bodice instead. Again, I will fold this shut, trim off, the side seam so I have the correct shape over there and then I would just have to fill in this waist dart so now I have my waist dart and side dart again so now I have a two dart bodice which is exactly the same uh, style that I make my bodice blocks myself that I use all the time here um, this one just wouldn't fit me it would fit that funny dress mannequin however it's almost it feels to me almost like working like a half size pattern because it's so much smaller than me <laughs> but again we're just creating uh, you know darts are just a way to make a cone that's what we're doing here. We're figuring out how to make a cone to deal with the cone of the bust. So that's what we have here. Um, it's just darts are just the, the triangles we need, the overlap we need to be able to make a cone, just like a party hat here. Please excuse my silly free clip art. So it doesn't really matter. Now, the thing about darts is for a party hat, if you imagine if the seam here is in the front of the party hat, it, it doesn't change the fit of the party hat if the seam is instead on the other side. So a dart it, we're using it to make a cone and it doesn't matter where on the bodice the darts are as long as they're radiating from the tip, the top of the party hat, the tip of the bust. The darts have to radiate out from there, but they can go into any spot and it doesn't change the resulting ge uh, like geometric volume of the cone itself. So uh, I'm just trying to express how when you move the darts around, the fit does not change. And so hopefully that is something we will be able to illustrate here today. But here I have a circle. Circle. This is basically how you would make a party hat of some kind. And let's say I have, you know, I close one pizza slice here. That's what my dart fullness is. And I have created a shallow cone, correct? Yes. But if I have the seam down here on the side, 
it doesn't really uh, make a difference if I have that seam, you know, here, or I have it at the top, I have it at the side. I, hopefully you can kind of understand what I mean by that. If I close this with less dart fullness, less dart excess, the cone is shallower for a less large bust, for example. And if I were to close this two pizza slices, then we create a large or like a taller cone and the volume is taller inside for a larger bust to waist differential, for example. So like, for example, my bodice in general has a large amount of dart excess because I need the cone to be pointier. But it doesn't matter where the seam of our party hat is, the same, the shape stays consistent, right? So no matter where that little seam, that fold over is, where our darts are, the same cone is created. Now, of course, we can split the, if we need to, if we know we need uh, one pizza slice of dart excess, we don't have to close it all in one dart. We can have two darts. We can close half of it in one and half of it in the other. So once we know our dart excess, which in this case, we'll say one pizza slice, one slice of this uh, circle, we can use that and split it between these two darts, halvesies like this, or you could open up four darts and have 25% of your dart fullness, dart excess in each one. Um, you can open up 27 darts and have, you know, a quarter inch in each. It just depends on how much dart excess you have and how many darts you have, where they are, is a design decision, not a fit one. Because again, this little circle friend here making a cone isn't that different from our bodice. The same idea applies. The tip of the party hat and the apex are essentially the same when we're talking about like the geometry of this. And I don't ever think about these sort of things in geometric terms until I have to kind of explain them like this. I I don't ever do any geometry. You notice I haven't bro broken out the protractor yet um, in order to do things like this. But the cones on something like this, making a little you know party hat and then arranging your darts around the apex of the bodice, it's a very similar uh, thing that is happening. It just seems weird because of course this is no longer a circle. It's the shape of a bodice. Now again, your darts can radiate anywhere from the apex. So I've drawn several different lines here, but these are just suggestions. Uh, you can put it anywhere. You can draw them anywhere, up into the neckline, up into the front, up into the center front of the waistline, um, into the side at an angle, whatever you would like. Now these on here are drawn around my actual darts, which this is one here at the waist, and this is the other over here in the side. This is a tracing of my bodice block pattern, which has two darts in it, a side and a waist dart here. But I can go ahead and move these darts anywhere I want to. Um, so if I wanted to create another dart, I could go ahead and cut down the dart legs of my actual darts here that are kind of cross-hatched in now. And now I can move this anywhere I want to. So if I close the waist dart, it opens it up into the side there. And because I have the side dart already opened up, now I just have one large side dart. This is the same as we just drafted over on the mannequin, one large side dart. Um, and of course, if I close that, you can see how this becomes the cone that we are looking for. And the amount of like overlap, the amount of dart fullness you need depends on the shape and the like height of the bust or the fullness of the bust. That will determine how much dart excess you have to work with. So if you have a very small bust, you won't have a lot of overlap in these triangles. Um, and there are ways to get around that for different designs, but I just won't be getting into that necessarily today. But again, I could also close the side dart here and then have a giant waist dart if I wanted to, if I just wanted to have a single dart bodice. Um, but normally I have at least two, just because when, when you do have a large bust fullness like that, um, I'm a double D by the way, um, it really uh, can be hard to get a smooth tip on the dart when you're sewing it. It really wants to become a party hat. So it can become uh, difficult to get a really smooth tip in when sewing it, but the fit doesn't change whether or not you have one dart or two or 17, as I've said. So like, now we have a dart up into the shoulder instead. So if I close this waist dart again, and I can close the shoulder dart. And again, the same cone shape is created no matter which pizza slice of this I decide to close up. As long as it's the same size of pizza slice distributed through all the darts, the same cone is created. Hopefully this makes some sense. Trying to figure out a way to display this visually it was not easy for my non-math brain. Um, this is my bodice block again, just traced so that all the dart fullness is in the waist dart. So again, I can move any of this anywhere I want to. Some of you may have a sloper or have gone to a class to, to create a sloper um, that has only one dart like this. I often see in 
older design books or sometimes in design books in different languages that they are starting with a block that only has one dart. And if that is the case, I always know that I can just split some of the dart fullness. Now I'm going to draw a line from the apex out to the side here to be able to create a side dart. Um, now you'll have this big one here, but the problem, you know, you can't just add a dart without taking some fullness away from the other one. So there's nowhere to, you know, stretch this into. You have to close off some of the other one. You have to sacrifice half of one dart to create another. So now that this is hinged open from the apex, I can layer this as much as I want and open up as much of a side dart as I want. So let's go ahead and just close this waist dart halfway. And we have opened up a side dart now. And I will go ahead and fill that in. So this is how you, you know, create a two dart bodice out of a single dart bodice or anything you're doing that happens to have one dart and for whatever design reason you would like to have another. Again, this is just a design choice, really. Um, not a fit one. The fit would have been the same. And we'll look at some bodices that have very different darts today, but I will make them up for you and show you how they fit me just the same. Now again, if I close this and then slice off the extra, we can get an idea of what shape we need to have. Like that. Because of course I want to fold my darts towards my center front. Some people learn to press their darts to, to the side seams. I learn to press my darts towards the center, so that's what I'm always planning ahead for. So this is my Again, basic two dart bodice block that you see me use all the time. This is just black poster board. But by splitting that dart into two like this, I end up with a very similar pattern. It would again fit the same. So um, this is essentially the exact same pattern. And uh, I need to come out away from my apex. Of course, when we're doing dart manipulation, we are always swinging directly from the apex itself. But when you are sewing a dart, you need to come down at least like probably five eighths to an inch and a half away from your apex. The larger the bust and the larger the sort of apex zone, the farther away from it you need to make your darts. So I think the general recommendation is five eighths of an inch. I go for an inch and a quarter away from my apex for my darts personally. That's the kind of thing you're going to find out through trial and error, sadly enough. But if you do take your darts all the way to apex, you end up with cone Madonna situation. So you'll notice very quickly. But here is my basic two dart sloper. This is the black poster board pat pattern we were just looking at a second ago. This is how exactly that pattern that we were just looking at in the blue pattern table of doom looks when I have it on. So this is, you know, a second skin. It's fitting me like quite like a sloper. And that's why it's my basic block that I use all the time. So same pattern here. But of course, I can start to make changes to this and uh, put the darts in different places instead of the side and the waist. And the resulting muslin will fit me exactly the same. So let's go ahead and just show you that. Because I get a lot of questions about like, how if I move the dart into the top, how does that change the fit? And the, the answer is, it doesn't change the fit at all. And so I'm just here today to prove it to you. Um, so let's just go ahead and close this side dart. Now, if you wanted to close it a little bit and end up with three darts in the front, you could. So let's close it all the way and move it up here into the shoulder. I use a shoulder dart quite often just because I sometimes sew them on the outside and I think it's a fun little accent just to have this little external dart up here. It's something that sometimes was done in the 1950s as well as an accent. Actually, I've seen it in the 40s too, I guess. But again, I need to come up an inch and a quarter away from my apex here and redraw my dart legs for how I will actually sew the dart. And again, I will fold this pattern closed to get the correct shape past the sort of seam line up here. Like so. So I've closed the side dart and opened it up into the shoulder now. But the fit of the bodice, I promise, has not changed. And you're saying, oh, that dart's a lot longer now. It's just because the circle of the cone party hat situation here is now a bodice shape and the bodice just happens to be longer up there so the dart is larger up there but we've gone from this two dart to this two dart two dart number a two dart b um, this is just moving that side dart up into the shoulder again the fit here has not changed the style I, lines i suppose just have so i'll grab some muslin here and cut a copy of this out again i did cut this with the center line here on the right of the pattern down the fold of this muslin so that i can open this up and it will cover both sides because we're always working on half of the pattern unless you start doing something asymmetric, which I will show you lastly in this video. So I'm transferring over my dart points here, where my dart legs need to go. Um, I'm just using colored pencil for this, especially because I'm just working on a muslin, but you can use tailor's chalk, you can use disappearing ink pens, whatever you wish to do. You can use thread tacks if you want to be very couture about it. Then I will transfer those same dart markings from my paper pattern onto the other side of the muslin here as well. And then I will collect, connect the lines to create my darts here. I'm just going to be using washable marker on this because again it's a mock-up so i just want to be able to see have things be as visible as i can for you here on camera to see what i am doing today and i'm sorry if my voice is getting quite gravelly i actually met up with a friend this weekend and uh, was talking all weekend and so therefore my voice is already shattered so apologies about that so i'm 
getting a little bit of probably whatever vocal fry is or graveliness. Ah, just because I've been chatting so much. I went on a bit of a long drive too, and I was singing Florence, and, you know, singing along to the Florence machine very loudly. So, you know, my voice is a little bit thrashed. But here I am just pinning my darts like I normally do here on the channel, just making sure that the lines are matched up either side. And we can come over here onto the machine. This is my Singer 99K. You can use whatever machine you may have around, or even sell these things by hand if you wish. But I start at the large end of the dart. I backstitch about a quarter of an inch there. And then I keep sewing. I like to use a smaller stitch length when sewing darts, something like 12 stitches per inch, which is what my machine is set to here. And I'll just sew along the guide I gave myself. Some people don't uh, draw in the lines of their darts and just, uh, you know, can eyeball it and good for them. The last about quarter of an inch, I almost curve it just a little bit off the edge, off the tip of the dart, like so. You, it's really subtle. You can not even really tell, but I just curve the last little bit because of course this area is going to be over the curve of the bust. So that can help out. And I will trim this off. And then I tie my darts shut. This is just how I was taught in fashion school, and I've done it ever since, and I like it. So I just gently pull the knot down to the edge of the fabric. Don't pull too tight or anything. Just gently tie the threads off shut so that nothing comes undone. And then I will trim these threads to about an inch long, and I will just leave them free inside my garment. Um, especially, if, you know, I'm lining my garment. It really isn't going to matter, but I've never had one come undone on me, even from an unlined garment. And I can trim the rest of my threads. So again. I just start at the top, the wider end of the dart, do a little bit of back stitching here at the top, top. Um, quarter of an inch, half an inch, doesn't really matter. Um, I don't really measure it. I just do it by feel at this point. Sew down my dart, curve a tiny bit whoop, off the end, like so, remove my needle, and then again I will cut these long enough that I can tie them shut, and that's just how I sew my darts. There are uh, This video isn't going to go into detail about how to sew darts much, other than you watching me here doing it now. Just because there are so many ways, there are many ways to sew a dart, and there are many blog articles and videos out there about how to sew the perfect dart. So sewing darts is uh, almost, there's more information about that out there, but I wanted to make a video all about pattern drafting with darts, I suppose, or what they are for, why they're there, and how we can use them, and how you can manipulate them a lot more freely than I think is known. Um, just because I think a lot of people think that darts are a very rigid thing, when in fact they're a very freeform thing. Here I will go ahead and press my darts. One way I like to press darts is uh, here flat, but using the end of my ironing board as like a, I guess like a cliff to help me press my darts. So here's these ones on this version of the bodice, the shoulder kind of dart version. And I'm just pressing these towards the center using the end of my ironing board. But you can see we've created our very like double cone shape here that we need to fit around the bust. And here is what this muslin looks like on me. And uh, I think you can see that the fit from our other friend has not changed much at all. Um, it's, it's virtually the very same. Uh, the fit is the same and from far away without being able to see the seam line, the dart lines, you would really not be able to tell a difference at all. So again, here is my, you know, side dart and waist dart. And here is the shoulder dart and waist dart, two different versions of the exact same bodice block pattern or bodice sloper pattern, I suppose. Again, I use sloper and bodice block interchangeably really. Sloper uh, is just, the skin tight version. Mine is so skin tight that I might as well call it a sloper. A block usually has some ease built in, but I like negative ease if anything, so uh, it makes it more difficult. A basic pattern that you can use to draft everything else, essentially. And usually the sloper is skin tight and then the block has ease added, but again, I just don't have very much ease, so mine block might as well be a sloper anyway. But here I'm tracing another copy of my standard two dart, like so, that we can work from. And I will show you, um, again, another you know, moving the darts again and showing you that once again, the fit remains the same. So let's do some more dart manipulation here. I'm going to this time put one of my darts into the center front here. What? Nonsense. That's right. You'll see it's a much shorter dart. It'll be like a short, wide little dart here. And then let's see, where do we want to put the other one? Let's put it up into the neckline here. And I will show you another way to modify the dart fullness in the pattern so that it um, you sew it a little bit differently, but it's I mean, virtually the same, you'll see what I mean. Let's go ahead and cut this out and I will do my dart manipulation. Again, slashing and spreading these darts closed and into their new spots. When doing any pattern drafting yourself, I highly recommend using pencil. In fact, using mechanical pencil. Whereas of course here on the channel, I try and use marker as much as possible so that the lines show up here on camera. Let's close this waist dart into the center front, shall we? So I have this open up here. Now this can be hinged and let's just hinge that waist dart right closed. So now we have moved that waist dart into the center front instead. 
Again, this does not change the fit. I'm just going to keep saying it. I'm so sorry. You can even use this little excess paper to fill in this spot up here, like so. We are going to have to add a center front seam to this front for this particular style I'm doing. So I will again fold dark closed with the dark fullness pointing down towards the waist, and then I will cut along the center front line here. I should have added seam allowance before I did this, but let's not talk about it. We'll get to it later. <laughs> but trim that off so I have the correct shape along that dart, like so. And then I'm going to, so now my waist dart is moved to the center front, I'm going to move the side dart into the neckline. Now, some people have asked me why you don't cut down the center of these, and I'll show you. Because when you start to try and layer these closed, um, it becomes annoying to have it uh, not cut along the dart uh, leg. There's a reason you cut along the dart leg, because it makes it easier to layer them closed. Um, so if I'm over here and I'm trying to close this dart, I have to layer the dart legs on top of one another. So instead of being able to line this up with the line, I have to line the dart leg up with the dart leg. So I have to like go underneath here and like try and double check and make sure I'm in the right spot, um, which is just not necessarily as quick as just cutting along the dart leg itself and swinging the dart closed. You know, see what I'm saying? And then if I wanted to only close it halfway, it would be even more annoying. Like if I wanted to open another dart somewhere else, but leave some of this. I just think it's always easier to cut along the dart leg. That's how I was taught, and to me it makes sense, but perhaps not to everyone, which is the lesson of me trying to learn how to teach. <laughs> because a lot of times I'm like, oh, but to me it makes sense, and now I have to figure out how to make it make sense for everyone else, which hopefully is what this video is doing today with the darts. Anyway, now we've closed the side dart. It is opened up into the neckline here. Our neckline is now all wonk wonkily shaped, but that's okay. I will tape this down here with some extra paper to fill in the dart that we've moved up here now. Again, we still have two darts. They're just in two different places once again. And again, the fit is maintained. Once again, we have been moving these darts from the apex. We need to make our dart point an inch and a quarter away from that apex. So I'm going to come out an inch and a quarter. We have this nice little short <laughs> wide dart here in the center front. But again, for the dart up into the neckline, I need to redraw my dart legs in, accommodating that space around the apex. Like so, and again, I will fold this closed with the fullness the wrong direction. Do I remember to do this properly? No, I do not. That's a shame. <laughs> For some reason, I have the fullness pointed towards the shoulder right now, but I will correct that in a moment. Ready? I'm like, wait a minute, what? What am I doing? Oh, there we go. I want my fullness towards the center front. <sighs> like so. So I will close this towards the center front, like so. And you can see the dart fullness interacts with the center front. Oh, that might be annoying when it comes later time to sew this area. So one way to control this, if your dart interacts with another seam line, is you can trim these off. I mean, you can trim off the corner like that if you want to, but you can trim off all of your dart excess if you want. So you can come in here and you just draw seam allowance along the dart legs, like so. Half inch seam allowance is what I'm using. And then you can just trim the dart excess away if you don't want to have to deal with it. If it's going to interact with something else, if it's going to get in your way, if you're working with a very bulky fabric or something, you can cut that away. Technically, you don't necessarily need it. This is still a dart. It's just now it's like trimmed. You can either trim it after you sew the dart or before like this. So I'm just trimming it before in the patterning stage, but you could leave the dart fullness in there and then trim it later after you've sewn the dart. It's up to you. But again, we're creating the same cone shape out of our bodice here. Now we have closed our two darts and moved them into new new positions, and yet the fit will be the same. Once again, I have to add seam allowance along the center front if I plan to have a seam here. So let's go ahead and add half inch along the center front here before I forget, and then I can cut this out of muslin as well. Now I don't need to cut this along the fold because of course the center front is a seam now, so I don't need to cut this along the fold here. I can cut it anywhere, but I do try and still line up the center front from the waist with the straight grain of the fabric. Grain is something quite important in sewing. Um, maybe we can make a separate video about that sometime because um, it's important to line your pieces up along the grain line indicated. Um, in commercial patterns, of course, this is always indicated. In When you're making your own patterns, you kind of get to decide. Um, I just line up my center fronts with the straight grain most of the time, like 99% of the time. <laughs> but uh, here I have just drawn in that seam allowance along the dart so I know where to sew my dart. And then for this little one here, I can go ahead and use my awl again to poke through my pattern to find the dart point, and then I will transfer the dart leg markings onto the muslin here as well. Again, just using marker for this. Don't use marker on your nice fabrics, unless it's one of those erasable ones or something. You know what I mean. Probably Crayola washable is not the way to go, but it works very well here for mock-ups. All right, so now I have to mark my dart on this other piece as well. 
Okay, so we're gonna have to sew these together eventually, but we'll sew the darts first. So let's sew the darts here and these darts in the neckline here, and then we can sew everything together. So let's go ahead and pinch this dart, line up my dart legs here, make sure that everything's aligned on either side. I usually use three maximum, maybe four pins to pin a dart, but you can use as many as you need while you're adjusting to sewing darts if it's something that's new to you. And here, you know, normally there would be that triangle of dart here, but it's just a seam now instead. It's almost like sewing a seam with a tiny dart at the end, but we'll sew it very similarly. So over here, I'm just going to sew this dart, pretending almost that the rest of the fullness is still there. And I'm just going to sew it the same way I would any other dart, sewing right off the end like that. And again, I will just tie this shut. It just has a seam allowance instead of dart fullness in here. But it makes no difference to how you sew the dart. You still just sew down along the dart legs and then off the tip at the end, tie the tip shut, and your dart is sewn. Like so. And now for this little guy in here, I'll just pinch that closed, line everything up. And I will sew this little guy in the center front here as well for both sides. And then another way to press darts that a lot of people prefer is pressing them over a tailor's hand because of course darts are trying to uh, create, you know, space for the curve over the body. So to use, to press them over something curved like a tailor's hand makes plenty of sense as well. So that's another way to press these is over a tailor's hand. But uh, again, I mostly prefer just using the like end of my ironing board. I've never had any trouble doing it that way. Just pressing my darts here, making sure the points are nice and smooth. And again, we've created the you know same cone for the bust here. Now, if you wanted to, this you could cut down to the tip and then press all of this open if you want to. And again, if you have a very bulky fabric, it may be a good idea, depending on what you're doing. Um, I just usually like to press it to the side, just like I would if there was still dart fullness there. So I just press them like I would normal darts as well. And then I'm going to do the other side the same way so that we can sew these buddies together down the center front. So I'll go ahead and pin these, just making sure that that dart is matched up the left and right here so that that will be a like straight little seam between the uh, dart points or between the bust basically so once that is sewn together like this with half inch seam allowance like we added the half inch of seam allowance while we were doing the pattern so sewn together down the center front and we are ready to go here i will sew some backs onto this so that i can try it on for you and show you that once again we've created the exact same shape of bodice just with different darts for a different style line but it will fit once again, and this is about to get incredibly repetitive if it, as if it isn't already, the fit will be the same. That's right. <laughs> the fit is the same. And here it is being worn. Once again, looks very similar from far away, that's for sure. But we just have this darts the darts between the bust and then up into the neckline instead for this version, of course. And once again, here it is compared to the regular, my, my two dart bodice block, once again, compared to the waist dart and side dart, and yet, even though our darts have moved, the fit is the same. So now that we know why we need darts and how they ended up on the basic sloper for like a fitted woven block, like I, you see me use all the time, why we have darts in the first place, it's just a way to manipulate fullest around the cone of the bust on uh, the body, we can go ahead and start using that dart. We, we know what our dart excess is, you know, whatever the amount of pinch out we need for our own particular unique body shape, um, we can use that in different ways. We can have it in one dart, we can have it in two darts, we can have it in 17 darts. We can use it as gathering, we can use it as plates, tucks, etc. So let's go ahead and start talking about moving these darts around and using them in our design work. So here again, back over on the mannequin, I'm gonna go ahead and pin this uh, back into another uh, darted bodice, I suppose. So once again, I have that straight line along the, straight grain pinned along the center of this. I have a line along the apex over to the side seam. So I have this fullness above here in the shoulder that I can again pinch into a dart. Once again, this is why we why we need darts, why they're there. It's to form the fabric to be smooth against the body. But I don't have to have a dart up here. I can have gathering or I can have many little pleats up here or shearing or uh, using controlling that fullness in any other way. So I don't have to pinch it into a triangle shaped dart. I can use it as gathering. So let's go ahead and pin this into place as gathering instead, like so. And the same is true down here of the waist. Let me go ahead and pin this along the side seam again, just so we can have that ready to go. And then we have again, this, you know, very easily pinches into a triangle, starts to become a dart, but we don't have to use this as a dart. 
we can again use it as tux or gathering or any other way of controlling this fullness. Um, and this is doing this via draping, but we're about to go ahead and do it um, just with flat pattern drafting because you don't actually have to change anything. You can just ignore the dart and gather it instead of sewing the dart. So I'll show you that in a moment as well. But this is the principle of it over here on the form. So you can see why gathering does the same thing that a dart does um, or why your darts can be used as gathering so easily. It's just because it's, again, just controlling the same amount of fullness that we know we need. Um, it's the same amount of dart excess just being controlled as gathers instead. So this is what the dart excess put into gathering looks like and how that you know translates when we're over here draping on the form, for example. Um, also, you can use the dart excess instead of using it, I suppose, as gathering or shearing or pleats, tucks, darts, you can use the excess instead, uh, you can cut it away and cut this into two pieces to create, let's say, style lines or the princess seamed bodice. So let me go ahead and pinch this same dart fullness from up here in the shoulder area down into the arm side. Of course, we don't have an arm side on this sad, sad dress form, but you'll just have to believe me. That's kind of where that would be. This is sort of mid armhole. And you can start to see, um, I'm gonna cut away this so you can get an idea. Uh, where the princess seam, the traditional armhole princess, which again is a terrible phrase, armhole princess. It sounds like some sort of weird, weird punk band. Um, it starts to be. You also can do a shoulder princess, which I've shown here on the channel before. I will link up to how to take a darted bodice and turn it into the princess seam. I'll put a video up above where I do this for a dress where I'm making a Luke Skywalker inspired dress, but I do go ahead and show how to do the princess seam, uh, a shoulder princess in that one. So anyway, we have this dart from the apex up into the arm side. And to create the princess seam, we would go ahead and draw a line along where this excess is, like kind of along one of these dart legs, over the apex or like over the bust through the apex and down into this waist dart. So let's grab a marker here. I've cut away the rest of the excess here so you can actually see what we're doing. And the light's kind of weird, but grab a marker here. And if I draw along this, you know, what would be a dart leg over the apex here and then down the dart leg of the waist dart if i separated these two pieces and cut away the dart excess you start to get a princess seam so this is how princess seams and style lines are done again utilizing darts darts are still in there they get eliminated when the two pieces are cut apart so this is still kind of dart manipulation even when you start getting into princess seamed bodices so now that we know a little bit more about how we can use darts in different ways let's try and copy some vintage designs using our darted bodice here. Again, this is just a tracing of that sloper that I'm always using, but let's go ahead and try and make this 1940s design from a pattern illustration here. Um, this is how I go about copying uh, vintage designs just by looking at the front of the pattern. Um, but here we have some gathering where there used to be a waist dart, it looks like. If you look at the waist of this gal, she's got some gathers down there, kind of where that dart used to be. So I assume we can just use this waist dart as gathers. So let's do that. Now we can use this other dart to create these tucks that are seen up here at the shoulder line. These don't look like uh, darts. They look like they're released halfway down kind of and open up and allowed to be almost like gathering from the end of the tuck down. So we'll create little tucks up there, which are just going to be darts <laughs> that we don't sew all the way down to the dart point. So let me go ahead and open up these three little marks up here in the shoulder. I just drew those in like so. I'm not going to be changing the neckline on this, but of course this um, blue dress here, she has a seam down the center front and a V neckline on this, but I'm just going to be copying the way the darts are controlled here. I could have copied the neckline and stuff like that if I was paying more attention, but this is just how to create the, uh, what to do with the darts, I suppose. So now we have those three tucks opened up in the shoulder line. I can go ahead and close this side dart, and now we have opened it up into the shoulder. So again, I can fill this in with paper and split that uh, side dart fullness up between these three darts up here now, like so. And again, I'm just going to um, fold these each shut and tape them as I go <laughs> um, so that I can cut off the shoulder line and get the correct shape. Again, I'm going to fold this with the dart excess or tuck excess as it will be used towards the center front here, like so. And this gives a good idea of what that's going to look like when it is sewn, honestly. Um, but I will go ahead and cut along here to again get the correct shape that I need along the shoulder line. And then I can take the tape off here. Put it aside because I'm making so many mock-ups today that I'm sure I will use that tape again. So now we have basically three darts up into the shoulder. 
but you can sew them as darts or you can sew them as tucks. So let's go ahead and sew them as tucks. So instead of marking the dart points out from the apex, I'm going to measure two and a half inches down from the along the dart legs here. And I'm going to sew these only two and a half inches into the dart excess, I suppose, and use these as tucks instead of full darts. So they will open up past this little tuck line. Let's just mark all of those like so and I will need to poke my awl through each of those spots so I can transfer that information onto my muslin or fabric. Um, as for the waist dart however you don't need to transfer the waist dart on I'll show you what you need to do instead there. So again I don't need to poke through here I'll show you. I'm just going to mark out an inch further from the dart legs basically because I can't gather everything down to that like uh, to close in the same amount of dart. Hopefully this makes sense. I need room for that gathering to go. Um, so I'm coming out an inch from either original dart leg here, which gives me two inches for all of this space to fit into. Oh goodness, this is kind of a geometry moment. I hope that makes any sense. Uh, basically, I can't gather the entire amount of dart excess down there down into a like single hair's width like I could with a dart. Like if I pinch the dart away, it all disappears into one line. If I gather it down, there has to be space for that gathers. So I need to come out from either side of the dart to create that space for myself. Hopefully you'll see what I mean when we get to gathering it later. But here I'm just marking all the ends of these tucks and all the dart legs for the start of them, basically. And then I will draw in all of these. Like so. Sorry about the light reflecting on the ruler here. Not all my points transferred through the paper. Enjoy the back of my head. <clears throat> like so. I need to figure out if I can mount. I have a GoPro now. I'm very excited to play around with that and learn how to use that camera because I'm always shooting here above the blue table. I'm using a DSLR and because I'm in a basement with a low ceiling, it's not always enough room to get a nice HD situation above the table. And I'm hoping maybe with a GoPro, I can figure out a new solution for filming above the table like this. But again, I just need to transfer my uh, dart markings to the waist too. And by dart markings, I mean one inch past the dart legs. Room for gathering down there, I guess. And you'll see what I do about that in a moment. Again, I will go ahead and pin these tucks just as if they were darts, honestly. Usually only takes about two pins here. Matching up the dart legs or the tuck legs, I suppose, as they are now. Because from here on they will be free. And I'm just going to, you know, backstitch at the start. Sew down the line, backstitch at the end of those. That's how I will do these. But again, I'm just pinning those quickly here. Like so, so we can try and copy this 40s bodice design. And it really, uh, understanding dart manipulation, it really becomes um, hopefully more simple to look at vintage designs and see, okay, so what have they done with the dart fullness? Like if we look at this vintage design, you don't see any darts, but that doesn't mean they're not there or that they weren't used to get to here. So uh, what steps were taken to get to this design from darts is what you're starting to do kind of like mentally when you look at designs that you want to copy. But here I am sewing my tucks again, just starting off at the end of the um, what would be a dart sewing down the dart leg until I get to the stopping point and then doing a little bit of backstitching coming off the machine. Now well, let's do that for all of them, like so across the top here for all six of my tucks. But that's really what I do to copy vintage designs. I look at the pattern images or a photograph or a dress in a movie and I'm analyzing, okay, if there aren't darts, if there are darts, I'll just move my my darts to where they need to be. If there aren't darts, what have they done with them? <laughs> like, have they cut them away and created a style line like a princess seam? Have they used them as gathering like they have here? Um, where have they been put? Because there has to be some way of controlling the fullness to conform the fabric to the body. And that's usually done with darts or the darts have been done, have moved into somewhere else. So I have to just analyze where have, where have the darts gone um, if they aren't there? So. And here I am putting two lines of gathering stitching in. I just have my machine set to a basting length stitch down there along the fullness at the waist that we marked where the dart used to be. And again, I can just press my tucks toward the center front neckline here. Now that they are sewn, you can do some top stitching on the outside of these, by the way, if you want. Depends on what you're after. Here are my little tucks and they have created, again, a bit of a cone shape over here. Now I'm going to tie off the threads of my gathering, two lines of gathering here closer to the center front, just so that I can gather this down. Some people don't like to ever like tie off their gathering. I happen to be someone who does quite like to tie off their gathering. Now I need this to measure the same as my 
bodice with the dark closed wood, which is seven and a half inches. So I need to gather this down until it matches seven and a half inches. That's just what my pattern happens to be. You'll have to measure what your pattern is without the dart, and then you will know how far to gather this down. But I'm going to gather right down to seven and a half inches, and then I will tie off the other end of these threads as well, because I like to live life on the edge. That's right. So now this is seven and a half inches, and so I know I have it gathered down to the correct size of waist in the front here, and I will tie off my other side and gather it down as well. If you haven't tried gathering with two lines of stitching instead of one, you're missing out. Always use two lines when gathering down. Um, it's so much better, and it gives a smoother result when sewing even. So this is this bodice style. We're starting to even look like our image a little bit here now. We have gathering at the waist, we have the tucks at the shoulder line. We're missing our v-neck, but you know, imagine. So the dart is still in here. We've just controlled the end of the dart with gathering instead of the dart itself. And once again, here is what that looks like on my body. Now we have changed the style of this bodice block completely. Uh, we have tucks instead of darts. We have gathering instead of darts, but the fit again is maintained. So I didn't have to like make a mock-up of this. I mean, this is a mock-up, but I didn't have to make an additional mock-up to see, oh no, will it still fit me? I know it's going to fit because the nothing about the fit has changed. Just the way that that dart excess was used was changed, not the dart excess itself. So um, it should, still should fit very similarly to how my sloper fits at its most basic form. Um, nothing much has changed about this. The style has changed. The fit has not. And now finally, let's take something that looks like a design that almost someone would say to me, oh, I prefer designs like this, so I need to do draping instead of flat pattern drafting. And let me tell you this. This here, I know you can't see any darts, but this bodice is still dart manipulation. It is still possible with flat pattern drafting. You don't have to drape something like this on the form. Um, it's asymmetric. It doesn't have any like structure. It's like, um, you know, would be nice cut on the bias actually with these draping lines. You cut it with a floopy fabric. You're thinking, oh, I couldn't do that with flat pattern drafting. I couldn't do that with darts. But let me tell you, we're about to. This is going to be our most complex demo of today, moving some darts around in an asymmetric way. So I have traced a full front of our basic sloper here instead. So this is just mirrored along the center front. Instead of being able to cut this along the fold, we are going to have to cut this all um, in like one layer. So let's first draw this little yoke that this one shoulder has. So we're going to cut this away eventually, and then we're going to move all of our darts up into this area to use as gathering instead. So we're going to move all four darts up into this area. So two from here and two from here. You could split this into more or less, depending on how smooth you wanted this to be up here. This will work just fine, so you'll see. <laughs> um, so these are going to be our new darts over here, and we're going to close all four of these. In order to do so, we are going to have to, of course, do a lot of slashing and spreading here, like so. And then we will have to cut off our little yoke. Keep that. We'll still need that. We'll have to add seam allowance to either side of this because, of course, of course, it has been cut away, so I'll have to add seam allowance here and seam allowance along this edge as well, but I'm going to move the darts first before I bother doing that. So now that everything is hinged open on the original darts, I have to hinge open my new darts as well. Um, you could do this one at a time too. I'm just doing it all at once because I'm just doing a demo for you. But here, let's do these two over here. So I can close this waist dart, which moves it up into that shouldery yoke zone that we made. There we go. We're using my tape here. Then I can close my side dart as well. And again, so both my waist and side dart have been moved up into that shouldery zone. Um, again, this doesn't change the fit yet. Um, if I sew those as darts, it would look just like my sloper. Cut that excess away, and I'll have to fill that in with more paper up there. But let's see if I have a piece big enough around. So I'm just going to split that fullness between these two new darts up here. Of course, I won't be using these as darts. You could, however, if you want to do, have these be darts, or uh, you could have them be tucks again, like we were just doing. You could um, press those tucks so that they were like little tiny box pleats if you wanted to. Whatever you wanted, but because I'm going to use it as gathering, I'm just going to smooth this area off instead of having to fold my darts. Um, I'm just going to smooth that off because I'm just going to use it as gathering. So we've moved those two darts on that side, and now this side we can move these darts as well. Again, we're crossing the center front here because this is an asymmetric design, which is why we have traced a full front like this. And this is about to get very wonky looking, but I promise in the end it all works out. So now we have our two new darts we want and our two old darts we're going to close. So we can go ahead and swing these closed and open that dart excess up into that same area on the 
left hand side here like so again because this is you know crossing a larger different di distance those darts look really long but it's the same the same uh angle of dart i suppose uh same amount of dart excess if we were to get the protractor out <laughs> the angle kind of is the same it's just moved into a different spot and so the darts are longer Again, I don't, you know, know anything about the math of this because I don't have to. I'm never doing, I'm always, I, I've been thinking lately and been replying to some comments who are like, this is too much math, that to me, pattern drafting doesn't feel like math when I'm doing it. It feels to me like origami or it feels like sculpting. It feels much more like art to me than math. Of course, this is an intersection between the two. This is an intersection between design and math. Um, there is a lot of geometry happening here, but I'm not thinking about the geometry happening. I'm just thinking, it's like the same way I, when I'm cooking, I'm not thinking about the chemistry, you know? Um, when I'm pattern drafting, I'm not thinking about the geometry. I'm just thinking about the sculpting and designing of it. This, because there are spaces between these darts, has plenty of room for all that to gather, and all that is going to gather down into that little shoulder piece we cut off earlier. But because we had cut those two pieces apart, uh, the rest of my bodice has seam allowance already included, but this does not because I have cut into the main body of it, so I'm going to have to add a seam allowance along this shoulder yoke seam and along the top edge of all this area of gathering as well. So let's go ahead and do that now. But yeah, I, um, I'm not good at math, you know? I wasn't good at math in school either. Um, I'm not terrible at math, but <laughs> I can't like, especially not anymore, like 10 years ago when I was in high school, I could, I could get by, you know, I got a B, but um, with, I struggled to get a B, I should say. But um, I haven't thought about math in a long time since uh, my engineering roommate helped me get through college algebra <laughs> during my degree. But, uh, you know, if you can use a ruler, you can do pattern drafting. It won't be bad. And you can see I haven't, like, have I measured anything much today? Not much. Um, but all four darts, all of our side darts, our waist darts, everything has been opened up into the area of gathering up here where this shoulder yoke is. Let's go ahead and cut this out of muslin once again. Again, I don't need to cut this on a two layer because it's a full front. I don't need to cut it on the fold either. I just need to cut out a single layer of these guys. So let's unfold the muslin here. Now I still want to cut this along the straight grain, my center front aligned with the straight grain. So I'm gonna do that. So I have my center front marking from the original pattern here, from where I mirrored the pattern. This is the center front still. And so I'm going to make sure that this is still aligned and parallel with the selvage of my fabric so that I'm cutting this on the straight grain um, again, you could cut something like this with the center front aligned along the bias too, depending on your fabric, how drapey you wanted it to be, how floopy we, uh, you wanted it to be. But it will also work just fine here on the straight grain, so that's what I'm going to do. Again, grain line and cutting on the bias. Cutting on the bias is a whole separate skill on itself. Um, and if you like very drapey 1930s slinky things, it will be important to know. I don't sew a lot of things like that, so I don't uh, worry about bias much in general. Other than like if I'm using stripes and I'm using bias for a design effect again. All right, so we have everything moved up into this area. I'm going to mark where the last start is and like the first start is because I know those are the spots I need to gather in between. So like on here, I need to gather in between this mark whoop, out to this one and all that needs to fit down into this little shouldery bit and we'll have that gathering across the entire bodice just from manipulating our darts up there. I could add more gathering in here if I wanted to, too. If you have a very, very thin fabric, you could probably fit more gathering up there. But for the fit of the garment, we haven't changed it at all. I haven't added anything additional. This is just using the darts to kind of create this style. And again, I'm going to use two lines of gathering stitching with my machine set to basting lace stitches, which is, I think, seven stitch stitches per inch on this machine. So the largest stitch length of my machine will do, basically. Ooh, my voice is not working any longer. Machine, machine, machine. I can't say it anymore. Anyway, so now I have my gathering. Once again, I'm going to tie off one side of this so that I can gather all of this down and sew it back onto the little shoulder yoke up there. Again, you could do this something like this using a contrast fabric. So if you wanted to use like, I don't know, like say a metallic brocade for the little shoulder bit, and it would almost look like an epaulette or something. And you can see here they've accented this with like three buttons, kind of a military style effect even then. And just a little tie belt and a large clutch this gal's got on. I love a large clutch as we know but I'm going to use all four darts of fullness up here and gather them down. Those were darts and you can see it's creating the same cone shape. The fit has not changed. That's right. How many times have I said it in this video? Take a shot every time I tell you that the fit isn't going to change, but I will go ahead and pin along that little shoulder yoke seam here and sew that on like so over here on the machine. 
again, half inch seam allowance. Um, it's nice to have the gathering facing the feed dogs because usually the feed dogs help um, like gather into, it's always good to have the smaller piece on top and the piece you need to ease in on the bottom. Something to do with the feed dogs. Uh, I just remember that, I don't remember why, which is the case with many things from my design school days. But I'm being good here and removing my pins as I go. What an idea. Like so. Give that a quick press over here. You can do some top stitching on this if you want to. You can clip that seam on the inside if you for some reason want to press it open. Um, now sew some backs onto that. And again, try this buddy on. So we're going for this sort of bodice design here. Again, this one has the high neck, so the neckline didn't even change on this. Um, I just need to add the sleeve and make the skirt pattern. And we could make a dress just like this one. I would probably make something like this out of a silk or rayon, of course, as opposed to a cotton muslin like this one. Cotton muslin has a very similar, well, I mean, it comes in different weights. This one's a pretty medium weight. This one is, a, I mean, almost a little bit on the heavier side. It feels almost like a quilting cotton. It's very similar to muslin if you've never worked with either. And if you have lots of quilting cotton around, feel free to use it for mock-ups. I think it's a great um, medium for that kind of thing. And sometimes you can get it on quite good sale. But here again, is this compared to the two dart bodice sloper, what we started from, what we traced to be able to get to here, we move the darts around, but they're still there, and the fit again is maintained. And here again is all of our muslins from today, or most of our muslins from today, in view all at once so you can see how similar they all are when it comes to fit, even though we've made different design choices, we've moved the darts around, but not for a fit purpose, instead for a design purpose. Now, there are considerations here when it comes to fit, We're talking about grain line, because of course where the dart is may engage bias in different bits, but unless you're using a very loosely woven fabric, this isn't going to come into play, and it is more of an advanced skill um, considering where bias is going to be, and I don't think it affects, it's never affected fit very much for me, so I have always been able to move my darts anywhere I want them to go, and I've never had it affect the fit of my finished garment. Like all rules in sewing, this is more of a guideline. Um, there are, you know, probably exceptions out there, but in general, if you move your darts around on your bodice, if you split them into more darts, if you condense them into one dart, if you use it as gathering pleats, whatever, as long as your dart excess amount stays the same, the amount of pinch out for your particular bust or curve stays the same, your fit will stay the same. That's right. If you have any additional dart questions after this video, do feel free to leave them in the comments below for me and I will try to answer them to the best of my ability. Again, I am just, as I say, one practitioner of this whole pattern drafting thing. I am not I am not a pattern drafting deity. I am merely, uh, you know, one student that is definitely uh, still learning, but I think it's important. Like darts are so, there's something so common in my sewing here on the channel and in sewing in general that I thought it was an important topic to cover all on its own. Thank you as always for watching today and I'll be back here with more vintage fashion, sewing, and pattern drafting real soon. Bye.